All right, so one of the purposes of uh, creating this conference was to bring together fields um, in a more diverse fashion than we were able to get at the workshop. And uh, Laura Dietz, our next speaker, is a fantastic embodiment uh, of exactly that. So she did her PhD work in a machine learning group and then did postdoctoral work in both an NL, well, both an NLP group and then also uh, later in an information retrieval group. Um, and now she teaches classes both in information retrieval and a separate class actually specifically in knowledge bases, um, uh, I believe. So uh, um, right, thinking about knowledge, at the beginning, you know, at, in, the, in my introduction, I talked about knowledge bases as either being these crisp graphs or maybe a kind of knowledge base as, as just you know, knowledge is represented by the raw text itself. And in question answering systems, we often use the raw text, and a key component of such question answering systems is usually an information retrieval system to efficiently ga gather just a few documents that we can read um, in detail. So that's information retrieval in service of answering questions as we would uh, ask a knowledge base. Um, today, Laura is going to talk about information retrieval in the, the opposite sense, how knowledge bases can help information retrieval. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> All right. I realize I'm a little bit shorter than this uh, desk was built for people, so I'm just going to stand a little bit to the side. If uh, I wander away from the microphone, just make funny hand gestures, and I will come right back. Uh, as Andrew just said, I'm Laura Dietz. Um, and I will talk about how to utilize knowledge bases and you know, any kind of AKBC technology uh, for text retrieval systems. Um, so as you may take from the title, for me, constructing a knowledge graph or a knowledge base is not the end goal. That's where my work starts. So I'm uh, here to kind of like tell you a little bit about um, the kind of like research results that we found in particular, you know, kind of like some dead ends that we ran into while trying to use AKBC technology. So kind of like see this as a wish list for me to you. So if you have any ideas on um, how you can help me do my work better, if you have any tools and technology that you want me to try out, well, uh, please do find me after this talk because I'm very interested in that. Um, all right. So. Um, so a while back in the IR community, uh, I started up like a small subfield that runs under the label KG for IR. KG stands for knowledge graphs and IR stands for information retrieval. And uh, we kind of like ran a bunch of uh, tutorials, workshops, journal special issues, and it was not just me. It was like, you know, with Edgar May and Alex Kotov and Jeff Dalton and Chen Yan Chang, and it's kind of like kind of sort of like a like a small uh, healthy sub communities that kind of like have been have been growing. Um, so I cannot, I will not give you my three hour tutorial today. So I'm just going to give you a sampler of each of those. So if you have any questions, please ask me later. Okay. So when I say text retrieval, my personal thing is to look into the really difficult kinds of information needs. And um, I call them like uh, open-ended information needs. Um, I also run a shared task called complex answer retrieval, which uh, is not to be confused with complex question answering because the questions here are relatively simple, such as um, here symbolized by this AKB, uh, XKCD comic, should be AKBC comic, by the way, um, like how, how do ice skates work? And what do we know about it? What do we not know about it? So the query is relatively simple, but the answer is relatively complex because there is not a simple yes, no, this entity, one meter 50 or anything like that. So you have to tell me a little bit more about the topic to actually understand the answer that I'm trying to get from you. Okay, and that's the case for a whole bunch of different information needs. Here, a bunch of them listed, such as uh, why is the UK leaving Europe? Answer this in a single sentence or less. Good luck with that. Um, or things that I just don't know anything about, such as uh, why is cash flow important for investment? I don't know, I know so little about either of these terms that I would need to have a little bit of more information about all of these terms to actually possibly understand the answer that someone could be giving me. Um, or what are the effects of water pollution? Or, uh, well, there was this diesel scandal that a famous German car maker called Volkswagen was involved in. How is that affecting other companies such as Daimler? Okay, so it's kind of like a complex thing. You probably need uh, a couple of sentences, maybe a couple of paragraphs to explain the question to me, especially since uh, even if there is a yes or no answer, that's not what I'm interested in. I want to hear everything about the topic. All right. So 
how do people currently solve that? So we have like two general go-to tools that we can make use of. Either we can try to find the Wikipedia article that was really written on that topic or any you know, Wikipedia equivalent blog article. Um, but that's often not really enough information or not recent enough information. So, um, for example, on the topic of uh, how is Daimler affected by the diesel scandal, uh, at some point we found only like one sentence on all of Wikipedia. And it wasn't even on the Wikipedia page of Daimler. It was like somewhere completely different. So if you want more than that, well, we have now depleted Wikipedia. Okay, so now what's next? Well, we can use web search. Uh, which means that you manually have to sift through hundreds or thousands of web pages, of which probably 80% say the same thing. Probably half of them are written by Russian trolls or something. So, um, well, so you come up pretty much like left on your own devices. So the research vision that I've been working on the last couple of years is can we maybe use good articles such as Wikipedia to train ourselves how to read the web and compose comprehensive articles with you know, similar flavors and semantics as on Wikipedia uh, from that. And kind of like be able to compose these web pages or like these answers on the fly in response to an information need. Okay, so no more pre-baked and stored Wikipedia articles, but maybe we can recycle some of this context if once a query comes, and that might be not just like customized to the particular question that was being asked, but also maybe to what the user's background is, et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of like imagine the direction here. And uh, I know a couple of people have been looking into generating Wikipedia articles, especially for structured content like protein and so on. So I'm on the side that this is completely unstructured open information needs such as uh, how do ice skates work and so on. So there's not a lot of templates to be found. Okay, so here's how I think this should work. Uh, a user is giving me the query, and that's going to be uh, the title of an article that I'm about to generate. And then uh, it's the computer's job, that's me, the computer, um, to generate this article with predominant facts about the topic and maybe an introduction. And then they identify that there are different facets that should be covered on this article and provide more details and information about that. And that's kind of like my personal opinion. I think that should all be driven and underfit by career specific knowledge graph. So that thing on the side is not just all of the knowledge graph, but it's just the subset of the knowledge graph that is kind of like relevant for this query. So not everything, but what is relevant and what's the relevant subset. And these two things are kind of like, should be sort of like not equivalent, but they are kind of like connected to one another. All right, clear, everybody with me? Okay. Okay, so and uh, in particular, the general direction that I've been thinking in is step one, find relevant entities that I should mention on this article. It's like my funny stick figures here on the side. Um, step two, find the relevant relations, not just all relations, but the relevant ones. And then step three, um, kind of like find the relevant uh, passages that maybe uh, these relations could be extracted from or where these entities are mentioned in or other kind of text snippets that are sort of like describing these different subsets of the over of the relevant information space. Okay, one, two, three. Well, how easy can that be? Right. Okay, so um, let's maybe look into what works and what doesn't and how some of this works. Okay, let's start with how do we find these relevant entities? So here's an example query. Uh, diesel scandal affect Daimler. Enter. Okay. So uh, how can we find relevant entities? Any idea? No, people are really tired. Okay. Here I'm going to give you some ideas. Okay. So there are three or so indicators that I usually like to play with. Number one is you take that query, you run an entity linker on it. That finds you some entities such as Daimler. That's kind of like my stick figure here. Uh, whoops. A stick figure here in the corner, okay? So we have that one, okay? But that's maybe not enough. Maybe we want to find some other entities that are not, not just the ones that are mentioned in the query. So here's my second indicator. We just take, we, we create, let's say, a full text index of all Wikipedia pages. We take the query, run it against it, okay? 
It's a pretty dumb method, works surprisingly well. You can also, if you have a more structured knowledge graph, such as what we find in Freebase, you can also derive a search index for that, where you just have you know, one field for the name, one field for the, ty for, one field for the type, one field where you, con where you collect all the like, related entities, and maybe the related entity IDs, and some you know, text snippets that you may have. So you can create like, what's called a fielded search index. Uh, you can essentially run the same uh, retrieval method against it. Oh, by the way, if you think TFIDF is a strong retrieval method, it's not. We don't even compare to that anymore. Anyway, it's an aside. Um, all right. So, and that actually finds us a whole bunch of entities that are on the topic that we didn't know of just from looking at the query text. Okay, such as you know Volkswagen and um, kind of like emissions testing and stuff like that. The third indicator, that's kind of like, I call it uh, like, the, like an anarchistic approach to um, uh, tr understanding the world, is what information retrieval folks call relevance feedback. So we take the query, we have a full text index of the web, we uh, retrieve documents in response to that query, we pretend that uh, maybe like the top 10, 20, 100 documents are relevant, we run an entity linker on those documents, uh, and then we can just look at well, how often, which entities are mentioned frequently, in particular in high rank documents, and we use that as like some more bottom up information. So we have these three sources, a couple of like variations on that, that we can combine together to actually get uh, a relative good idea of which entities are relevant. Okay. So um, why is this useful? So we have for every entity, we don't just know that there is this entity as an ID, but we also have, um, sorry, sorry for the. Let's give up on the full screen mode. Um, so we have the uh, um, kind of like we have the name, but we also have the different kind of category and relations. We also have the full text index of this Wikipedia article, so we know that, for example, words like uh, car, uh, innovation, uh, industry are all associated with the entity Daimler. Okay, so we can make use of all of that to now actually go out and find better articles on that topic. So it's kind of like a feedback loop to this uh, relevance feedback idea. And um, that was actually one of the first articles that I wrote in how can we make use of knowledge graphs for information retrieval, and we actually, uh, that was in 2014, and we bumped the bar of like some, at that point, 10 years old standards that we are still holding, despite the fact that neural networks have entered that field as well. So it's kind of like what I tell everyone, if you don't really like NLP for whatever reason, at least use entity linking because you would be stupid not to. It's like a very strong indicator. You can make use of, of that a lot in information retrieval. All right, so, but how do each of these three different sources work? So clearly th running an entity linker on the query is kind of like useful information, but it's relatively sparse. Okay, so you don't get a lot of information out of that. And if you just add that information, it's not enough to really make a significant dent in an information retrieval benchmark. Um, the second indicator actually gives us some interesting results. However, not all relevant entities have pages that mention why this entity is relevant for the query. And often that's you know, things like the United States of America is relevant for a whole bunch of different things. Um, but the Wikipedia page on the United States of America is kind of like limited, so obviously there are like many, uh, many queries for which USA would be relevant that are not mentioned on the, web, on the Wikipedia page of the United States of America and so on. Um, and that's exactly the reason why the third indicator is like really, really, really strong, although uh, I think it could use your guys' help. Right, because now we're actually looking at text and try to extract what does this text really say about the entities, how are these entities connected, and how are these relations connected, right? So kind of like the third part is like really strong, but I need your help, okay. So let me talk to how to identify relevant, inform relevant relations, okay. So again, we have the same query. Um, if you just look at the knowledge graph and you would just say, well, we now know which entities are relevant, let's just like take the part of the knowledge graph that connects these entities that, that we have really identified as relevant, you're not going to be particularly satisfied with what you get. Okay. So part of the problem is, well, there's kind of like so many connections in the knowledge graph and some of them are clearly relevant, but the vast amount of relations you find in a knowledge graph are just not. Well, they're correct, 
they're relevant in some other context, but they're just not relevant for this particular kind of query that the user asks. Okay. So um, it's kind of like actually very difficult to say which of these relations are on topic versus off topic, okay. if you just look at the graph structure. And I think in part you will find actually in 2013, 2014, there were a lot of papers written that kind of actually use uh, graph walks or knowledge graphs. And somehow people have stopped using that. And I was like, what's going on here? And what I realized is that the knowledge graphs that we have today are much different than the knowledge graphs that we had in 2013, right? So we kind of added more information which should make things better. But then it also makes things harder because the length information is like less and less and less useful the more information you add to it. Okay, it's like I think some in the graph uh, um, field it's called like the densification of knowledge graphs. So here's what we had in KGs in 2013. You had a few of these things, all the head facts, the really important things. And in 2019, we have a lot more connections. Well, actually, that's an understatement. It looks more like that. No, it's actually also an understatement. Actually, this is probably like more accurate, right? Okay, so we have this huge spaghetti ball of all kinds of different relations uh, of which 99.9% .9 are not relevant for the query that we're looking at. Okay, so and uh, funny story, uh, one of my PhD students who was looking into topics about the environment said, I have a problem with California. I was like, what are you talking about? I don't have any problem with California. It's a great place to be. And she said, no, no, no. The problem is once I find that California is a relevant entity for my topic, now if I start walking around, I now go off into the world. Right? I go to Google, I go to Facebook, I go na, 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 and it has nothing to do with the topic anymore. Okay. Anyway, um, I want to kind of backtrack into some of my uh, recent work. Um, it's uh, just recently got accepted. It will be published uh, in a few weeks from now. Mm. And it's called ENT rank. And essentially, it's a method for entity ranking. Uh, at least that's like the first step, um, where we use um, entities, neighbors, and text to actually help us to solve this problem a little bit better. So how does this work? Um, so we start out with uh, some documents that we retrieve on the left. Uh, we have entity links in them. If you don't have them, we will create them for us. So that will kind of give us like a pointer to these entities. And now we can actually turn that one into a graph that you see up there on number two, where um, every time we find uh, a text passage that mentions two entities that turns into an edge between these two entities, we can build a hypergraph from that. That's kind of like a candidate graph, and we're going to do some more fine-tuning and weighting of these edges to identify what's relevant and what's not relevant, and use these like, kind of like different indicators to learn an edge weighting of this graph, so that which then actually helps us identify which entities are relevant. And my next step is to kind of like also say, well, which passages are relevant about that. OK. Um, let's maybe look into, some, into one of these uh, edges for a second. Um, so here we have kind of like uh, three entities. Um, diesel engines is one entity. I know I used the person stick figure here, so that's kind of like, I think of it as more like a general notion of entities. Like diesel engines, emission scandal, and lawsuit. And we have like two passages. Um, you can like see them here at the bottom, like Volkswagen in, in, intentionally programmed uh, turbocharged direct injection diesel engines to activate some emission controls during, only during laboratory emissions testing. Okay, so that's kind of like one thing. It's kind of like quite a little bit of a mouthful. Um, and we just take that whole paragraph and we take all the entities. I mentioned them and we just create an edge across these entities and we put the paragraph on the edge. Okay, um, and then we have like these three kinds of like feature groups. Um, if, you want to if you want to measure how important or how relevant is this purple entity in the middle, we have three kinds of indicators. First are kind of like indicators about this entity and how relevant that is. Think about the first three indicators. Second one is, are the neighbors relevant? Get indicators from that. And the third one is, is the text relevant that we find on these edges? And then we kind of like take all of that together. Okay. So my edges are annotated with paragraphs and probably all of your toenails are kind of curling up at the moment. Why was I not using relation predicates? Okay, that's a good question. If you didn't have that question, you should have asked me that three minutes ago. Okay. Um, and I think part of this is, well, these paragraphs are sometimes a little bit difficult to understand 
for relation extractors. And also, um, I have some earlier work that actually tried to use some of this that kind of like ran into a bunch of dead ends, which is where I get to the wishes part of my talk. Okay. So, um, right. So in 2016, uh, and I think I read, uh, I, I pretty much like absorbed all these relation extraction papers when I was working with Andrew. Um, and at the time, there was like a tech KBP and uh, the best performing system from Ben Roth. Uh, so I kind of said, hey, Ben, uh, can I maybe use your system? I would like to try it on some of these like uh, text to kind of like under understand text a little bit better for retrieval. And at that time, everybody says, oh, we need to use relation extraction because it's somehow good for IR. And we kind of turned that around and said, is it as a research question saying, if you would have relevant documents and we would add relation extraction to that, would we get relevant relations, question mark? Okay. Um, anybody wants to take any guesses? You said yes? Okay. So I think the answer is 50-50. And uh, so what we did here is we only looked at relations that were correctly extracted. And then we evaluated how many of those relations are actually relevant for that topic. And we found 50% of correct relations were relevant. And that doesn't mean that that's like, I think it's, it's just like more in, in, the, in the matter of the text, because in the text, we have things that are relevant for this topic. And then we have other things that are mentioned on the side. And the relation extractor doesn't identify which one is which. But I think that would be actually kind of like really important. So if you have any idea of how to work on that, please let me know. Um, and we figured that this is not just something that happens for schema-based relation extraction. We also did the same thing with open information extraction using a system that uh, Kirill was also talking about in his paper. And we found again 50%. And then we had uh, uh, Amina Kadri uh, manually extracting relations, which are called a human-based relation extraction. And that was also kind of like 50% of those were relevant. And I think it's kind of like a natural property of text and of natural language that we talk about things that are really on topic, but also about some kind of like other things that are more marginal for this particular kind of query. Um, kind of like flipped over this one here again. Um, so we also found that, uh, we looked at a bunch of different indicators. I'm not gonna talk about the details of this paper, but for example, we were thinking, is maybe if, you've, if we have a relation that we extract and that relation is already part of a knowledge base, like here we use DBpedia, maybe that's an indicator that this relation is somehow like more relevant than others. And the answer is no. There's no information in this kind of like correlation. Uh, I think someone earlier called this a KB hit. So the KB hit was not an indicator of relevance. The other problem that we ran into with the schema-based relation extractor, especially with tech, and it's not very surprising, is the whole schema was just not helpful for 60% of the queries. So I was really excited when Heng Ji told me that uh, tech KBP this year uses a whole bunch of different relation extraction. I was like, yes, finally. So it made me like really happy because I would like to use this kind of stuff, but if it's only about people, organization, and places, uh, there are not a lot of uh, retrieval benchmarks I can, I can apply this to, so that's gonna be very interesting. Um, right. So um, by coming back to the OpenIE work, um, one of the other problems that we ran into is kind of like what I call a coverage problem. Uh, it's not just that for schema-based relation extraction, well, the schema didn't match, that's one kind of coverage, but also um, when you run an OpenIE relation extractor and you require that you would have sentences that mention uh, the entities with their full name so that an entity linker can pick it up. Now you only are left with like 5% of sentences in the corpus that even have, you know, uh, correct extractions. So then if you use that one in, in a larger information retrieval pipeline, like here I think it was for the purposes of finding support passages why an entity is relevant for the query, then um, you just don't have enough extractions to really make a dent for this downstream task. So uh, here we have kind of like a, a bunch of different columns. The TFIDF is kind of like really like a TFIDF sentence retrieval system and it's like up there. And then uh, part of speech and NER didn't work quite as well. Dependency parsing also didn't really work so well. OpenIE actually worked really well by its on its own. But when we take everything together, well, we get a significant yet not very large improvement. And that was kind of like really underwhelming and kind of like uh, took the excitement out of this line of work. So um, I think maybe now since a couple of more years have progressed, I want to kind of like pick up this work again 
um, and trying to make use of OpenIE extractions for the purpose of information retrieval. So if you have any interesting systems I should have a closer look at, please come talk to me after this talk. All right. The third problem, like issue that I'm fighting with is kind of complex relation expression, expressions. Um, here we did like two example paragraphs where um, I'm not sure how many relation extractors would directly really capture the important relations here, right? Um, and I mean, in particular, kind of like these things often like go beyond one particular, one single sentence, so we definitely need to go across sentences, and it's often like a little bit more complex than just having sentence level relation extraction tied together by, by co-reference, but like there are still, you know, um, many, many tuples that would then be uh, connected to one another which wouldn't really form a coherent complex relation. So I think that's something we should all be working on and uh, if you need a data set, please come talk to me. Um, here's, for example, like a couple of more sentences from a data set I've been working on in a shared task that I'm hosting uh, on the topic of the effects of water pollution and in particular the eutrophication facet. And you, I mean, read for yourself, but they're all kind of like talking about the problem uh, of over-fertilization of uh, farmland, where then the fertilizers gets washed off into the river systems. So now we have a lot of phosphorus and, and nitrate sitting in the rivers where they are fertilizing the algae and algae are blooming and then sucking up all the oxygen, therefore all the fish die and we have all a bunch of, bunch of like different problems in our, in our waters. And they're all talking more or less about the same thing. They're using very different words. They kind of like talk about the thing in like different levels of details and uh, well, I want to say help. <laughs> so, uh, any information about how to actually attack these pieces of text would be really, really welcome. All right. Um, I can't remember I said, this is kind of like data from a shared task I'm running called a track complex answer retrieval. The data set is up there, and for the last couple of two years, it was um, more like an information retrieval task um, where we gave uh, participants the the title with the query and uh, an outline of different headings and said, hey, can you retrieve relevant passages for each of these different headings with the idea that maybe we have something of a ransom letter of a Wikipedia article that then we can like further organize in the next steps. So this is an exciting moment. We are now transitioning into the next phase where um, we're going to give people a query and some different facets and we actually try to really put together paragraphs to really form an article and up next is going to be like some more consolidation and maybe a query specific knowledge graph construction. So anyone who's interested in that, please also come talk to me. All right. So this is my last slide. Um, here I just like summed up my wish list. Um, I think it's a kind of working on like general purpose uh, relation schemas with many different fine grain types would make me really happy and I'm more than very, very keen on trying out all these different tools to like uh, help me solve my information retrieval problems. Um, kind of working on like higher recall and coverage would be really, really helpful for me because the more if I don't have enough coverage, it's not even worth my time to really further dig into that um, because I'm not going to make a dent in my own community. Um, having especially extraction of these complex relations, which are beyond sentence level triples plus coref, but really trying to understand when something is a connection of a bunch of different facts that are kind of like put together as an argument would become like really important. Um, bridging existing knowledge graphs with text would be useful because especially when your relation extraction schema is not super powerful, then often I'd like to use a pre-existing knowledge graph, but there's kind of like very little bridging, so that would be all kind of like very useful. Um, finally, uh, maybe let's have a new team, uh, like a new new community called relevant information extraction, kind of like bringing together IE and IR, that would be kind of like a great dream of mine, and identifying like query specific knowledge graphs, uh, sort of like in the line of the tech cold start task, but maybe more centered around one particular kind of topic uh, is definitely also like something I would be like a core of the team. All right. So the data set that I just showed you is available online. Some of this is not officially published and released, so if you kind of like want a data set to play around with, just come talk to me and I can show you a secret website to uh, maybe for you to kind of like have a, maybe try out some things um, and without, without having to set up a full-fledged retrieval system. Anyway, thank you very much.
please fill the awkward silence. So in my own thinking about building knowledge bases lately, I found myself gravitating towards now that raw text is the knowledge base itself, just augmented with entity linking, and, the, and we'll just find relations into the full context in which the evidence appeared originally. Is that enough for you? I mean, it seems like very, like very close to IR already. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, first of all, I don't think that they're necessarily like true disjoint fields, right? It's like uh, somewhere in between. I actually was kind of like, uh, I, I kind of like once submitted a, a, a slightly prov provoking paper where we place the word knowledge graph as hypertext because that was essentially what my method was using of knowledge graphs, um, which is kind of like, you know, in some ways, um, uh, I would like these methods to be a lot smarter, but right? it doesn't make me happy that I put a whole paragraph uh, on the edge and say, well, entity linking is the one thing that works, and other than that, I don't know, it's like nothing that's kind of like strong enough to really, uh, to really make a huge dent. So that makes me extremely unhappy. So, but I need your help because I'm not going to be able to figure this out all by myself. So, I would like to have it more than hypertext, yes. Oh. I answer quick, we can three questions, hopefully. <laughs> Do you see a role for graph, uh, subgraph matching, graph isomorphism in helping you solve these problems? Mm -hmm. So part of the problem is that this domain is like incredibly noisy, so we would need to have not, it would certainly not be an exact matching, so we would need to do something noisy, something that's kind of like, can also deal in the lack of identity, making a reference to Chris's talk. Um, I do think graph patterns should be part of it. It makes me also very unhappy that any kind of like graph structure by itself seems to be completely useless at the moment. So I just think, I don't think that graph structure is useless, but I think we need to do some more work to understand how to make graph structure useful again. And part of it may be, may be a prediction problem of, can you predict the relevant part of a subgraph, not just assuming that a simple heuristic would cut it, because I don't think it does, but if you would have that, now we can actually reopen the door for all kind of like graph-related algorithms. Okay.